This ethics podcast is sponsored by my anonymous friend from Los Angeles in loving memory and Le'ilu Nishmas, his cousin, Bezad Emmanuel Ben Mashiach. May his soul be elevated in heaven. We are now up to chapter 4, Mishnah number 29, which is the final Mishnah of chapter 4. It's been a long road, and it's great to be all the way at the end of chapter 4. There are six chapters in the book of Perkei Avos, so we are two-thirds of the way done. This is a very intense Mishnah. It's one that talks about life and death and afterlife and judgment. It's also about the futility of trying to escape divine judgment. And when I read this Mishnah, it made me feel about, you know, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. And I felt like this is such a germane subject to really remember during that part of the year. Now, the author of this Mishnah is the author of the previous Mishnah, Rabbi Elazar HaKapar, who gave us a very short, succinct idea that envy, lust, and pursuit of honor remove a person from the world. And along these lines, we have this present Mishnah. I will read it and we'll go through it uh, bit by bit. Hu haya omer. He used to say, hayiludim lamus. Those who are born are destined to die. And those that are dead, Lichios, they are destined to come back alive again. Vehachayim, and those that are living, Lidon, are destined to be judged. Leda, Lehodia, Ulihivada, in order that you may know and tell others and become aware, Shehu Kel, that he is God. Hu Hayotzer, he is one who forms, who fashions. Hu Habora, he is the creator. Hu maven he is the one who understands, who discerns. Hu Adayim, he is the judge. Hu aid he is the witness. Hu Baladin, he is the plaintiff. Hu Asad Lidon, he is in the future going to pass judgment. Baruch Hu, blessed is he. She'en lefan of lo avla. Before him there is no iniquity. Velo shikicha, and not forgetfulness. Velo masupanim, not favoritism. Velo mekach shochat, not bribery. Shakol shalom, for everything is his. Veda, and you must know. Shakol lefi hacheshbon. That everything is according to the accounting and reckoning. And don't let your inclination assure you that the grave, base manoslach, is a place of refuge and escape for you. For against you will you are created. And against you will you are born. And against you will you are Living, you are alive. Ve'al karchacha atames, and against your will, you will die. Ve'al karchacha ata asid litain din vecheshbon, and against your will, you are destined to give a reckoning and an accounting. In front of the Almighty, blessed is He. We can see it's a very long Mishnah. It seems a little bit long-winded. It talks about life and death and judgment. Very intense. Let us begin to see what we could learn from this Mishnah. So it starts off with an introduction. Those that are born are going to die. Those that are dead are going to come alive, are going to be reborn. And those that are alive are going to be judged. The first thing he tells us is that everyone that's alive today is going to die. Now, I don't think this is something that we didn't know. It's not like he's revealing something new to us. But I do think that this basic truth that everyone knows is true and no one contests its validity and veracity is something that we don't really think about often. We don't think about our own demise, our own mortality, and we definitely don't think about the mortality of everyone else around us. We don't think about the fact that, you know, within 200 years probably – maybe 100 years, 150 years. Everyone that's alive today, all the billions and billions of people that are alive today are all going to be dead. It's not something that we ruminated upon for uh, obvious reasons because it's a depressing thought perhaps. It's a sad thought. It's a thought that we just don't want to think about. But that's how he kicks it off. That's how uh, he begins this Mishnah. Welcome to the Mishnah. You're going to die. But then he tells us that whoever is dead will come alive again. So everyone who's dead, well, who does that include? That includes everyone that's ever lived, right? That's a lot of people. They're all going to come back alive. And the living 
i.e. the people who are brought back to life, the people who are reanimated, they will be judged and their fate will be decided when they are judged. And don't think you can escape God's judgment. Oh, no. You can't hide from him. Don't think that you can hide in the grave. That's not a place of refuge. And he'll be fair. He'll be. He's the judge. He knows it all. He is the witness. He's the plaintiff. He's in charge. And this is all going to happen against your will. You're formed against your will. You're born against your will. You live against your will. You're di- you'll die against your will. All this happens without your control. And, of course, you will be judged by God against your will. So let's try to understand what some of the messages are. And I want to do this, you know, kind of go go through it uh, piece by piece and then see what the takeaways are. So first of all, he tells us that we're going to die and we're going to come alive and we're going to be judged. When we realize this basic truth that we will die well, then we have to live our life before we die accordingly. Because we know that after we die, there's going to be some process of judgment. And what is the nature of that judgment? That is judgment where we are going to be judged based upon the decisions that we made when we are alive right now. And therefore, if you know that there are consequences for life, the choices you make, the decisions you make, the things you prioritize, the things that you choose to focus on, the agenda that you seek to put your attention to, those decisions are going to be scrutinized by the Almighty. Well, then it raises the importance of those decisions and it should encourage us to say, oh, well, make sure we get these ones right because it matters. Now, it's also interesting that the Talmud tells us That when someone sins, in essence, says the Talmud, that is a reflection of ignorance of this basic fact, the fact that you will die. By the Talmud's definition, a sin is a choice to favor your temporary existence over your permanent existence. It's to favor your body over your soul. It's to favor your life now before you die, over your life later on after you are brought back to life again. It's choosing this world over the next world. Now, no one would do that if they realize that this world is temporary and that world is permanent. And therefore, the only way someone could sin, explains the Talmud, is if this basic fact is ignored. If you don't realize that you're going to die, well, this is the world that you see. You'll see nothing beyond it, and therefore it makes sense to try to improve your situation over here. makes a lot of sense. But when you have this contrast, we have a temporary life here, and we're going to die. Oh, and after we die, we're going to be reanimated, and then we're going to live again, and we have to be judged before God for our decisions. If that was present in your mind, a simple, basic cost-benefit analysis would cause you to reject any sin, to eschew any sin, and you would never sin. Says the Talmud. If you want to fight Yetzirah, you want to fight the inclination, all you have to do is remember the day of death. You remember the day of death, says the Talmud, you'll never sin. Because by definition, a sin is only possible when that is ignored. Okay, well, what's going to be when we are reanimated? What is the state of our existence when we come back alive? What is the purpose of being reanimated? After all, you know, we live and then we die and we come back. Why? You know, we tend to assume there's a certain degree of finality with death. This is the end. Here we discover this mission. Now, well, no, it's not the end. When you die and someone gets, you know, the, the, there's big signs, rest in peace. We have a nice funeral for them. We put them in the back of the Cadillac and you drive them to the, to the funeral home and everyone says nice things about them. They're interred in the ground. Okay, that person is done. They're finished. 
But here we say, no, oh no, they're going to come back alive. This is the idea of resurrection. Says the Talmud, this is one of the 13 principles of Jewish faith. If you want to believe in the precepts of Jewish faith, you have to believe in the idea of resurrection of the dead. But this is something that appears very hard for us to square. Well, what's this idea that all the dead people who've been rotting, who've been decomposing, they're going to come back alive? The Talmud actually raises some interesting questions. The Talmud says that Cleopatra, she asked the sages, well, when they come back alive, are they going to be clothed or are they going to be naked? That was her question. But a lot of people asked other questions. Well, we believe in the concept of reincarnation, so a soul may be associated with lots of bodies. Well, which body is the soul going to be associated with after the resurrection? Will I be a sprightly 20-year-old? Or will I be maybe, you know, an old and uh, uh, falling apart 98-year-old? You know, maybe the age that you were when you died. But what is going to happen to us when we are reanimated is something that really, it really fascinates us. And we don't, it, we don't, it's not so clear what the answer is. What is the connection between all the various words used to describe things that happen to us after, after death? You know, in, in Jewish eschatology, there's the idea of Gan Eden, paradise. Sounds pretty pleasant. Of course, there's the other place called Gehenna. We don't want to end up there. Well, what's that all about? We have the idea of Yemosa Mashiach, the days of Mashiach. We have the idea of Tchis and resurrection of the dead. We have the idea of Olam Abba, the world to come. How these pieces all fit in together is something that we maybe should ponder. But I want to just kind of, I want to start with the basics. Number one, the Talmud tells us that this is something that even in the times of the Talmud, people found it too fantastic. People viewed this idea with skepticism. And they had to explain to other people, what does this even mean? Says the Talmud. There was a Caesar who spoke to Rabbi Gamaliel. This is in the Talmud Book of Sanhedrin, where much of the discussion related to resurrection, death, afterlife, reanimation, eschatology, when that's discussed in the book of Sanhedrin, all the way in the 90s, in uh, the end of the book. So the Caesar tells Rabbi Gamliel, you say that all the people that are dead are going to come alive. But after they're dead, they're but dust. Can dust really live? Can you animate dust? Is that even possible? So Talmud says that the daughter of Caesar, she told the rabbi, says, you don't respond to him, let me respond to him. And she responded with a question. There's two contractors in the city. One of them builds buildings out of plaster. One builds buildings out of water. Which one is more impressive? Which one is a greater feat of engineering? So, of course, the Caesar responds, well, if you build out of water, that's incredible. So says the daughter of Caesar, well, in this world, the Almighty builds humans out of water, i.e. the primordial biological fluid. So if the Amaya could build out of water, certainly the Amaya could build out of something more substantial, i.e. like plaster or dust. That's what the Talmud says. So what it's trying to do is trying to, to, to frame the idea that, you know, we live in a world that people do exist. And if you told an alien, hey, there's two ways to build people, which one of them sounds like it's a more feasible way to build them? Do we take some earth and then infuse it with the soul with some life? Or we take like a, you know, a tiny microscopic bit of fluid and somehow something magical happens and a baby's born. Which one of them sounds more reasonable? So I think the alien would say, well, if something more substantial, you want to build a person, you know, you, you know, it makes sense to take some inanimate matter and then infuse it with animate matter. That makes more sense to the uninitiated. It's only because we live in this world and we are, so to speak, influenced by the realities that are fixed in our world. Anything else that comes from a different sphere from a different dimension, from a different reality, from a different set of physics, that doesn't seem to resonate as much. So we have this idea of resurrection. Again, it's the first thing we're told about this mission. You're going to die, you're going to come back alive, and you're going to be judged. Now, there's, I think, another important point 
That's one of my pet peeves. I may have said this before to y'all. And that is uh, the, the naming of what happens after we come back alive. So in, in, in common parlance, that's called the afterlife. Oh, don't worry. There's an after party. Don't worry. If you miss the party here, we have an after party in the afterlife. Oh, you'll be comforted. You have a tough life over here. Don't worry, but the Almighty will give you a, a, a good a good shake in, in the afterlife. According to our philosophy, that's not how it works at all. Our real self is our soul. Our real life is the life of our soul. Our real world is the world of the soul. Our real existence is the existence when we exist as a soul. Our real existence, the real life, is what we call the afterlife. And therefore, it's kind of flipped on its head. I propose that we don't call this world life and the world that comes next the afterlife. I'm going to flip it around. I want to call this world the pre-life, the pre-game party, the preparation, the organizing, preparing, fixing, getting ready for life. And the afterlife, as it's called, should more aptly be named life. But, of course, the mission tells us that the choices and the behavior that we made today, that's going to determine our status in life after we are reanimated. And therefore, we believe that the critical decisions to determine our status in life are done here in the pre-life. If we're not ready, if we're not prepared, if we're not properly dressed and ready for the occasion, then we are not good candidates to flourish in that world. We've seen already a mission earlier. The mission describes the connection between this world and the next world as traveling down a hallway or corridor before a great ballroom. If you're going to go to, let's say, a king's celebration in the ballroom, the banquet of the king, well, you got to make sure you dress properly. If you come in rads, if you come in uh, short shorts, well, then you are just going to not be allowed past the palace gates and you are going to be disqualified. Okay, so we have the first idea of the Mishnah, which is you're going to die and then you come back alive. And what happens after you are born anew a second time? Well, then you are going to be judged. So the one thing we know about what happens in the afterlife, or at least in this life that's described in our Mishnah, is the idea of judgment. Now, this is also found in a very famous exchange. We may have mentioned this as well in the past. In the Talmud book of Sanhedrin, page 91a, going into 91b, there's a famous debate between two great giants of the second century of the Common Era, the leader of the Jews, Rabbi Judah the Prince, and the leader of the Romans, Marcus Aurelius and Deninus. And they were friends and confidants, as we have spoken about in the past. And they had several high-profile debates about very important matters of theology and eschatology. And the Talmud says that Antoninus came up with a brilliant scheme, a loophole, if you will, to exonerate people from judgment. And Antonina said as follows, the body and the soul can each exonerate themselves from judgment. The body says, hey, it's the soul that sinned, because ever since the soul departed from me, I'm like a rock, totally useless, totally incapable of sin. So it must be that when I did sin, it was the soul's fault. And the soul says, well, ever since I left the body, I'm flying around like a bird, totally incapable of sin. So it must have been the body's fault. So each one could deflect blame on the other, and consequently, you can never pin down culpability on any one of the two. Ta-da! Checkmate. You cannot judge not the body, not the soul. So Rabbi Shiloh Prince responded with a parable. And he gives the famous parable. There was a king who had an orchard. And he appointed two guards to guard the orchard. One of them was blind. One of them was lame. So none of them could have actually consumed many of the fruits. And he says to the kid, said, make sure you don't destroy these fruits. Guard them, protect them. So the lame guard who was seeing 
he said to the blind guard who was able to walk, he said, hey, I see these beautiful fruits. Give me a piggyback ride and I'll direct you and we'll snatch the fruits and we'll share the spoils. So that's what they do. The lame guard, he gets a piggyback ride on the blind guard and he directs him, make a right, make a left. Here we go, grab some fruits. And before you know it, the place has totally been denuded of its fruits and they are relaxing and enjoying the spoils of, of victory. And of course, the king shows up. And the king says, who ate the fruits? I appointed you as guards. You didn't do your job. So the blind guard says, look at me, I'm blind. <laughs> it couldn't have been me. It must have been the other guy. And the lame guard said, well, it couldn't have been me. Look at me, I'm lame. I can't even reach the fruits. It must have been the blind guard. So, of course, the king knew exactly what happened. And what did the king do? He takes the lame guard, once again puts him on the back of the blind guard. He reconstitutes them the way they were during the sin, during the heist. And he judges them like one person. So, too, says the the prince, the Almighty will take the body and the soul and reanimate them, put them together, take the soul and throw it back in the body and judge them as one. He quotes a verse in Psalms, the Almighty will call to the heaven, i.e. to the soul above and to the earth below for judgment of his nation. Take the body, take the soul, reanimate them and achieve judgment. So here we discover, at least for the wicked who have sinned, that the objective of the resurrection and the reanimation and the reunification of body and soul is to facilitate judgment. When the body and soul are separate, well, you have Antoninus's argument that none of them are liable. And therefore, when they're reunited together the way they were when they sinned, you can judge them as one. Now, there's a very important Rabbi Yoni here that expands the subject greatly. He quotes a verse in Daniel. This is one of the verses that's always quoted in this in this particular subject that describes the resurrection. Many of those who are sleeping in the dust will get up, will awake, will arouse, and will emerge. olam, these, i.e. the righteous, for eternal life. olam, and these for reprimandation and for eternal judgment and punishment. So here we see that what actually separates the righteous and the wicked is this post-reanimation judgment where they are sent to different camps, so to speak, the righteous camp, the wicked camp, the righteous are rewarded and the wicked are punished. Now, to complicate matters just a little bit, if you look at the sources, it's pretty clear that there is judgment that happens to a person's soul after they die. So even before they're reanimated, we have, we have again a timeline. You live, you die, you're born again. Well, what happens after you die? So the sources talk about how the, you get judged. But how can you be judged? Don't we see the Talmud tells us you only get judged after you're put back together again? So one of the answers to this question is as follows. There's a concept of limited judgment, and then there's a concept of comprehensive, total, great judgment. It's called the Day of Judgment, Hagadol Vehanorah, the great and awesome judgment. And one of the ways this is explained is as follows. Of course, we believe that the Almighty judges everyone, Fairly. This is, of course, the continuation of our Mishnah. The Imani is fair, judges everyone according to the calculation, and there's no protection, as they say in Hebrew. You can't hide away from your sins. You get rewarded from all your mitzvahs, no matter how bad you are, in aggregate. The Almighty is perfectly fair in judgment. But the judgment is not limited to the action that a person takes, but everything that emanates from that, the ripple effect of all your behavior 
is all included in the grand tally of the judgments. If someone does something good, but that good leads to other good, which leads to other good, which leads to other good, like a, like a cascading, uh, a pyramid, one good deed, but it ripples, it emanates towards other good deeds. The way the Almighty judges it is not just in the vacuum of the original deed, good deed versus bad deed, but everything that accrues from it. You teach someone, you encourage someone, you connect people with other people to do good things, you introduce someone to their spouse. Anything that you do, you inspire someone, you support a cause, anything that you do, ad infinitum, accrues to the original person, the original deed. So, for example, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, every mitzvah that every Jew does – and not just every Jew, every person that's inspired by monotheism to do good, to believe in God, to have faith, the world over, that all accrues back to Abraham. Every single mitzvah of every Jew in history, well, that's only the product of Abraham's decisions and Abraham's commitment and Abraham's self-sacrifice. All that is tallied to his account. So, of course, it's just absolutely astonishing the amount of merits that Abraham has. But that, of course, works on the flip side as well. Rashi tells us uh, when uh, there was the first fratricide, Cain and Abel, Demei Achecha, so I came, the bloods of your brother are crying out to me from the ground, says Rashi, according to the Talmud, that when Cain murdered his brother, he didn't just kill his brother, he killed all the people that would have come from his brother. And all the grandkids and great grandkids and great 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 grandkids and the billions and billions and billions of people that Abel was destined to to father, all those were murdered. How many people did the Nazis kill? So the answer is six million, but each one of those people may have had a family of their own. So that number is probably now a hundred million already, and soon it'll be a hundred billion people. And so on. And therefore, if you want to tally the true reward and punishment of people's deeds, you have to wait till everything's over and this world is closed and the accounting can be done comprehensively. And therefore, while someone may have an initial judgment, there is the ultimate judgment, the great judgment. That must be done after everything is all set, everything is all finalized, and all the permutations and results of all the behavior can finally be seen and known. So again, the mission starts with with great intensity about this idea of life and death and real life, reanimation and judgment. Then it continues, in order that you may know and tell others and become aware that he is God, he is the one who forms, who creates, who understands, who judges, who is the witness, who is the plaintiff, and he is going to judge you. This idea that we're conveying at this Mishnah, the idea of our life and our death and our afterlife and our judgment, is so important, we have to know it. We have to study from others. And we have to teach it to others as well. And we have to Become aware of this principle. So there's a very interesting Rabbi Yona here where he says that when we become aware of this principle, that is a reference to the afterlife itself. All these ideas that to us may seem foreign, the idea of, of someone who's been dead, lifeless, coming back to life, the idea of us really having a soul that really matters, that really exists after the soul and the body are no longer united. That's really true. It's something that for us is, is a, is a, is a concept. For us, it's, it's an abstract idea. Of course, we're believers. We believe it, but it's not a visceral reality like our physical reality is to us. But in the afterlife, i.e., our soul's perspective, this is totally True, it's inherent, it's innate. In all of my body, the soul knows it. For us, it's something we need to, to pick up. And then we get a description here of God. He's the, he's the God, he's the creator, he's the fashioner, he's the discerner, he's the judge, he's the witness. 
And the commentaries explain, well, what does this mean? You have creation and you have formation. The way it's described is there's creation ex nihilo, something out of nothing. And then there is the fashioning something out of something else. There's so many wonderful insights and little nuggets from this Mishnah. So, for example, Rabbi Yoni here, when he talks about the Almighty creating and fashioning, he compares it to making a, a vessel. That you start making the vessel and then you complete making the vessel. There's two parts of creation of the vessel. But after someone finishes the vessel, after the the craftsman, the artisan, finishes the vessel, the relationship between the creator and the creation is severed. Whereas with us, we are created by God, but we have a continuous relationship with him every second. Our continued existence hinges completely on the Almighty infusing us with a never-ending stream of vitality. The Almighty sustains us every second. He is the creator and the fashioner of us, but he also understands all of our deeds, and he and he alone can be the judge. After all, the Almighty knows everything. He to be the judge. It's all revealed to him. He to be the witness. He will judge fairly. But of course, we who don't have complete knowledge, we cannot judge at all. Now, the Almighty is also the plaintiff. This I found very interesting. The Almighty is the plaintiff. If I do something wrong, who have I offended? Who have I aggrieved? I've aggrieved the Almighty. Well, what if I did something wrong against my fellow man? We know the Torah is broken down to mitzvot between men and God and interpersonal mitzvot. Well, what about when there's interpersonal sins? Says the commentaries here, even if I cause pain and suffering and damage to my fellow man, it's not my fellow man who's the true plaintiff. It is the Almighty. And he will judge us and there's no chicanery. There's no iniquity. We can't say, hey, I'm, I'm close. I'm chummy chums. I got this. He doesn't forgive people based upon their aggregate righteousness. He can't say, hey, um, I study Torah. Hey, I have piety. Can we just ignore this? Can we sweep this under the table? None of that. The mind does not take bribes. And the grave is not a hiding place from God. The Yetzirah tells us, my misery ends if I'm dead. If you're in a tough situation, if you're in a bind, oh, if I was dead, I would be free from all this all this difficulty. Because people assume, of course, that once you're dead, that's it. It's over. Oh, no. Death is not final. And thus, it cannot serve as a refuge to solve your problems. People think that if they die, or of course, if worse, if God forbid, if they kill themselves, then they are going to be free of any consequence. But here we see, no, that's the, that, that's the position of the Eight Sahara. That's the false promise of the Eight Sahara. But ultimately, of course, it's not true. You exist, you continue to exist, and you will not be able to to find a refuge in the grave. And the mission ends with five things that happen to us against our will. Each one of these stages, something that we don't want to happen. We're formed, we're created, we're born, we live, we die, and we have to give an accounting and a judgment for our actions. We're formed. What does that mean? Well, that means that there's something physical about our existence. There is a very long midrash. We may have gone through it in the past, but it's worthwhile to look at it from time to time. That describes the soul's displeasure with being created or being formed, with being born. 
The soul, we're told, is hewn from the Almighty's throne of glory. Meaning that it comes from a place of exalted spiritual loftiness. And for the soul to be infused into a physical environment that is antithetical to God, that is antithetical to the soul and to its standing, that is something that it takes to uh, very negatively. The soul absolutely abhors the notion of it being bound to something physical. And thus, at conception, when the Almighty summons the soul from the storage place where all the souls are kept, the soul stridently opposes being forced into or being encouraged to go merge with the body. Of course, at the time, the body is just maybe a clump of cells, but already then we're told that the soul is infused into it. And the soul protests and it objects. And the body says, no, this is what I want you to do. And the soul says, no. And the body has to force the soul in and station angels to guard against it escaping. So this is all before birth. The soul is suffering because it doesn't want to be there. And then the major goes on to describe what happens to the soul for nine months during gestation. So it is based, the seed of the soul is now inside the zygote, which becomes a fetus, which becomes, or becomes an embryo, becomes a fetus, becomes a child. But the soul gets educated over the course of those nine months. The angel gives the soul, we're told, it gives it uh, some important information. It takes it on sightseeing tours. In the morning, the angel comes and picks up the soul and says, we're going to go visit some stuff. Isn't this exciting? We're going to act like tourists. Brings it to Gan Eden, brings it to paradise. And the soul is shown the righteous people. And they're sitting in great honor. And their crowns are on their heads. And the angel tells the soul, do you know who these people are? And the soul, i.e. part of the soul that's mobile, tells the angel, no, I have no idea who these people are. So the angel responds to the soul, well, you should know the people that you're looking at, they were exactly like you. They too were forced into a body, didn't want it. And they too were born, didn't want it. And they too lived and didn't want it. But they observed the Torah and they observed the mitzvahs. And therefore, they merited and they received this great reward that you see. And you should know, continues the angel, that you too will be born and you will live and you will die. And if you are meritorious and you observe the Torah of the, of the Almighty, of the Holy Blessed Sea, you too will be welcomed into this select and most rarefied fraternity. But if you don't, this is the exact words of the Midrash. Vim lav. And if you don't, and if not, da, you must know, I will show you there's another place that you could arrive at. Okay. And at night, continues the Midrash, the angel once again comes and takes the soul and shows it a different place, brings it to Gehenna. And the description is a little bit difficult to read, but that's what we do here. We read difficult things. And the soul is shown how the wicked ones who are in Gehenna, there are punishing the angels, whipping them with strings or ropes of fire. And the wicked ones are suffering and they are recipients of no mercy. And again, the angel tells the soul, or at least the part of the soul that's mobile, do you know who these people are? He says, no, I have no idea. He says, well, these people who are being burned here, they were just like you. They too 
were forced into a body, and they too were forced to be born, and they too were forced to live. But unfortunately, they rejected the Torah and its laws. And therefore, they received this treatment. And you should know, again, the same warning. In the future, you will be born. And you should be righteous. And you should not be wicked. And you should merit the reward for eternity. And again, I'm, I'm shortening this midrash by a lot. The angel tells the soul all kinds of more interesting things. Shows it where it's going to live. And where it's going to die. And where it's going to be buried and brings them all around the world and shows them the righteous people and the wicked people, shows them everything. And then a knight once again brings it back to the place where it belongs, where it is seated inside the womb of the mother. And at the end of nine months, it's time for the child to be born. And again, the angel shows up and it tells the soul, hey, we're going into this world. You ready for this? It starts to protest. And it says, I don't want to go to this world. It doesn't sound so exciting. And the angel tells the soul the words from our Mishnah. Against the will you are formed. Against the will you are created. Against the will you are born. Against the will you live. Against the will you die. Against the will. Against your will you will be faced to judgment and again the soul protests and it is forced out the angel has to come and smack him and it is born and immediately it forgets everything that it learned hitherto and all that it knows and the midrash tells us the reason why babies cry right when they're born It's because of this gross demotion that their soul has essentially been extinguished, i.e. it's no longer in charge. The soul is now a hostage to the body. It's hostage to the Yitzhara. And what will happen to that soul is out of its hands almost. And then he has another audience with the angel. When the time for the person to die has arrived, the angel comes to the soul and says, Hey, do you recognize me? And the soul says, I think I do, and I don't like (laughs) where this is heading to. Why did you come today and never been here before? And the angel tells the soul, Well, now it's time for you to leave this world to go back to where you came from. And again, the soul protests and starts to cry and its voice can be heard from one end of the world to the other. But of course, people don't recognize that sound. Only the rooster recognizes it. I don't know what that means, but that's what the major says. And the angel says, well, I already took you out of multiple worlds. This should be a cinch. And again, the soul is not mollified. It protests. And again, the angel tells it, against your will, you're formed. Against your will, you live. You're born. You die. And against your will, you are going to be judged by the Almighty. As I mentioned, this is a very, very intense Mishnah. I think it's probably the reason why I was put at the end of this chapter. Because it does collect a lot of the ideas that we've seen in this chapter. This is a chapter that deals with the fundamental questions of what are we living for? What's the purpose of our life? What are we here to try to accomplish? What is our mission? What are the consequences? What is at stake? What do we stand to gain or lose relative to our choices? And it's telling us, it's telling us straight. It's telling us straight. We are alive today. There will come a point in time where we will die and we will face judgment. And the Almighty is the only one that could do this kind of judgment. And there's multiple layers of judgment as we're told, as we've discussed the judgment the judgment that's described after the resurrection is a judgment that's a comprehensive one, that's all-inclusive, that takes into account everything. But regardless, we have to know that we're going to face judgment, and therefore that should be the guiding light of our life, our decisions, and our priorities in our existence here. I want to end off with one very nice idea that I saw one of the commentators points out. 
when it describes the Almighty's judgment, it says, you should know that everything is according to the calculation. Well, what does that mean? So, of course, every commentator has their own way of, of explaining it. By the way, the amount of commentary there is in this Mishnah is just staggering. We try to, we try to kind of get the gist of the idea without going into all the, all the details as the commentaries are wont to do. But this, this piece is a really nice piece. I want to share it. What does it mean that the mind's judgment is all according to the calculation? So I think this is a very comforting idea, and that is that the Almighty's judgment is all tailored to every individual. There is not a uniform standard that everyone's judged by. Everyone's judged as an individual. Everyone has different temperament. Everyone has different background. Everyone has different abilities. Everyone has different skills. Everyone has different influences. Everyone has different circumstances and background. Every person is unique. Everyone's different. No two people are the same. And therefore, everyone is situated in a different way of their life. For some people, what they find challenging for other people is very easy because of the particular circumstances of their existence. And therefore, the Almighty's calculation is precise and the judgment is based upon the calculation. If there is a person that is capable of a lot and they accomplish a little, well, that is all going to be done relatively. I'll give the example. If you have someone who, who can accomplish a thousand units of accomplishment and they do a hundred, and then you have someone else who's able, whose max capacity is a hundred and they do, and they do 90. So in absolute terms, the person who does more, that's how we judge them. We judge in absolute terms. The mind judges everything relative. And it's possible for two people to do identical things. For one person, it's a mitzvah. For the other person, it's a sin. Someone who grows up in a very, let's say, disadvantaged world and the influences they had were all negative and then have people that mentored them, that guided them, Someone like that is bound to make worse decisions than someone who grew up in a very uh, in a very positive environment with wonderful influences, with stability, with security. So you can have someone who does a sin, and we would judge it as a sin, but the Almighty would judge it as a, as a mitzvah. He only shot one of the hostages. That's a pretty radical example because murder is terrible for us. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. He only shoved the woman down before he snatched her backpack. He didn't pummel her. You know, that's not a persuasive argument to a human jury, to a court of your peers. But here we're told the mind he's going to judge everything. Everything's on according to calculation. And that is comforting to know that we are not expected to do more than we can do. We are not expected to accomplish things that we're just not capable of. Of course, we have a tendency to say, ah, I'm not capable of that. Oh, it's too hard for me. But the Almighty knows the truth. The Almighty knows the truth. And the Almighty knows exactly every circumstance of your life and how it all fits into your judgment. And of course, even you don't know that. Everything is taken into account by God. And therefore, the judgment is eminently fair. It's eminently fair. So that, I think, is a very comforting uh, takeaway message. Of course, it's scary. This is a scary Mishnah. The idea of us dying, which is the first thing that we read about in the Mishnah, even though we know it's true, it's just put out there right at the very beginning for all to see. It's a scary thing. We don't want to think about that so much. But that's just the beginning. We're going to come back alive, and we cannot hide. And the Almighty is able to tabulate it all. And everything happens against our will. Our soul doesn't want any of this part, any of this. It would just rather stay up in heaven, stay under the throne of God. It's very happy there. And it's forced again and again to do things that it doesn't want to do. This is a difficult, scary Mishnah. But it's a valuable one. Because if we actually absorb its lessons and we take it to heart, our whole life will be, will be changed. Our whole life will be lived for a greater purpose, for our soul, 
for our eternal existence. And we had this angel try to warn us in, in utero. We don't remember it. If we did remember it, we would have no free will. If we actually remember what it was like to go visit paradise and to visit purgatory, if we remember that, that's it. There's no more free will. So there has to be an element of doubt for it to, for the system to work. But our sages are revealing to us. But the Torah is revealing it to us. And it's, it's very useful to know. So the hope is that we take some of these lessons uh, to heart and we are influenced by them. And hopefully we can live lives and be assured that when we go before God, we say we did all we can. We tried as hard as we could. When we made mistakes, we tried to rectify them as soon as possible. And we could be hopefully proud and they might not be proud of our life and our accomplishments and we could forever enjoy the fruits of our labor in the afterlife. Nay, not in the afterlife. In our life that we are preparing for so studiously. I thank you for listening. My email address is rabbiwolby.com. I look forward to any questions, comments, or feedback of any sort.